Bruchem Aboyim, thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our house. Uh, before we begin the class, today is a very special uh, day in my life. Uh, it is my Hebrew birthday. According to tradition, we have a belief that on a person's Hebrew birthday, they have the right, the power to bless people. So what I'd like to do is give a very special blessing to all of those that are listening, that uh, I know that it's a very special year, a very difficult year. And I'm sure that God Almighty has blessed you all. After all, you're all favorite children to God Almighty. God loves his child. As the Holy Baal Shem Tov says, that God loves each one of you even more than a woman who has waited into her late years to have a child. And imagine how much that child means to her and how much she loves it. And yet, the Holy Baal Shem Tov says that God Almighty loves each individual even more. So I'm sure that he has set aside a very special year for you. But my blessing to you is whatever he has designated for you for blessings should be doubled. And if for some reason you have to have any difficulties during this year, then at least let them be cut in half. And may God bless you and your family with health and with wealth and with safety and with happiness. And again, may we be able to see the world in a better way this year. And may we see, again, peace with the coming of the Messiah, again, quickly in our time. So our class today is, will be on a time of joy. What does that mean? So we're about to enter the holiday of Sukkot, a holiday that is really framed in an aura of joy and happiness, something we need very much today. You know, in the book of our heritage, written by Leo Quito, it states, that all, that all of the observances of Sukkot are performed with joy. All. The Torah mentions joy with reference to Sukkot more frequently than any other festival. In fact, joy is considered one of the seven commandments of the holiday itself. When the Torah mentions Passover, Pesach, there is no explicit, there is no explicit reference made concerning joy. In, in connection with Shavuot, the second of the festivals, there is only one mention of joy. However, in connection with Sukkot, the third festival, joy is mentioned again three times. It says, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in Leviticus 23, and you shall rejoice in your festival, Deuteronomy 16, 15. And then in the next verse, it states, and you shall be only joyous. So the question is, why is there so much joy connected to Sukkot? Much more so than the other two festivals. In addition, we have to wonder as to why we celebrate Sukkot as a holiday by itself. After all, Shavuot being celebrated as a major holiday is logical. Shavuot is the day that we celebrate the marriage between God and the Jewish nation. Our rabbis tell us that although the Jews had fallen to the 49th level of impurity, there were only 50. They lacked basically any merit to be redeemed. God redeemed them the merit of them accepting the Torah on Mount Sinai 50 days after they left Egypt. They kind of were redeemed on credit. It was also the day that he officially gave his Torah to the children of Israel. In a true sense, it began a new world. And that explains why Shavuot would be celebrated as a separate holiday. But still, Pesach and Shavuot, pardon me, Pesach and Sukkot, <clears throat> Both have the same theme, the exodus from Egypt. On the night of the 15th, <clears throat> 15th of Nisan, the Jewish nation ate their Paschal offering with their matzah. There's a medrash that states that on that night of Pesach, that God took them on the clouds of glory to the site of the temple to partake of their offering there and then brought them back. And the next morning, they left Egypt and were surrounded by the clouds of glory. We are told that when the Jewish nation was camped on the banks of the Red Sea, with the Egyptian army at their backs, it was the clouds of glory that protected them from the catapults and arrows that the Egyptians were hurling at them. The clouds observed everything that the Egyptians threw at them. Nothing got through. So the obvious question is, then why don't we eat our matzah in a sukkah? After all, there were three gifts given to the children of Israel while they traveled in the desert for the 40 years. 
these three gifts were given to them in the merit of the three shepherds of Israel. They were Moshe, Miriam, and Aaron, all siblings. Now the mun, the spiritual food <clears throat> that came from heaven daily, fell in the merit of Moshe. The well, the sea of water that accompanied them on their journeys, flowed in the merit of Miriam. And the, cloud, the seven clouds of glory, which were four in each direction of the compass, one above them and one below them, and then the seventh cloud which led them by day and gave them fire and heat by night. These clouds were brought in the merit of Aaron. All these gifts were given to the children of Israel shortly after they left Egypt. The only one of the gifts whose presence was ever interrupted was the clouds of glory. Forty days after the giving of the Torah on Shavuot, the Jewish nation sinned grievously. They worshipped the golden calf, idol worship. With the best of intentions, it was Aaron who made the calf. This was considered a misdeed on his part and a punishment. And as his punishment, his gift was removed from the people. Now, the clouds were absent for three months. And it wasn't until Moshe came down from the mountain for the third time with the second set of tablets, that he instructed the people that God had actually forgiven them for the sin of the golden calf. Moshe said to affirm that fact, God wanted them to build him a dira betaktona, which means a dwelling place in this lower world. They would then be able to witness firsthand his presence in their midst and know that God had actually forgiven them. Now, Moshe came down from the mountain on Yom Kippur, and five days later they began the construction of the tabernacle. On that day, the 15th of Tishrei, the clouds of glory returned and stayed until the death of Aaron in the 40th year of their journey in the desert. God did not wait until they finished building the tabernacle to reveal his presence. No. Once they started, once they started, his presence became, was immediately revealed. Much like a loving father who anxiously awaits for the opportunity to forgive his child and reconnect his love. Now we learn a great lesson from this story. It is our job to start. And once we do, we will always find divine assistance to finish. As we read in the Torah, the tabernacle was built with divine assistance. After all, the Jews that who left Egypt were bricklayers, not artisans. Without God's assistance, they could not have constructed an edifice as ornate as the tabernacle. So two of the themes of Sukkot are the return of the clouds of glory and the forgiveness by God for the sin of the golden calf, symbolized by the construction of the tabernacle, the house of God that would stay in their midst. These themes stand by themselves apart from the redemption from Egypt and were a true source of joy <clears throat> for the nation of Israel, something to celebrate. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned that the Torah mentions joy three times with the holiday of Sukkot. I believe <clears throat> that the Torah mentions joy three times to include God Almighty, the nation of Israel, and all the nations of the world. And this would mean that God, <clears throat> Israel, and all humanity share in the celebration of this holiday of Sukkot. So how do we see this? So the verse in Leviticus states, and you should rejoice before the Lord your God. This is the only verse that uses God's name in, in connection with Sukkot. So we have an allusion to God. <clears throat> the verse in Deuteronomy states, and you shall rejoice in your festival. Again, your allusion to the children of Israel. And the third mention in Deuteronomy, the next verse, states, and you shall be, and it says, ach, you should be only joyous, which is an allusion to all the nations of the world. The extra word only may well include their joy. It just could have said, and you shall be joyous. The extra word tells us that it comes to include something, and that is the nations of the world. Now we know <clears throat> that on all the holidays, there were communal sacrifices and that were brought in the temple. 
In addition, there were other sacrifices that were brought, such as peace offerings and festive offerings. They were eaten primarily by the people. Now, the holiday of Sukkot is unique in holidays in that there were additional 70 oxen that were brought up as sacrifices. These 70 oxen were for the 70 root nations of the world. Yeshua ben Levi said in the Talmud that if the nations of the world would have known the value of the temple for them, they would have surrounded it with fortresses in order to protect it. For it was of greater value for them than it was for Israel. Now, every sacrifice that was brought in the temple was accompanied with a meal offering and the pouring of a prescribed measure of wine on the altar, called a libation. Now, during the seven days of the festival of Sukkot, a libation of water was added to the wine, together with each of the daily offerings. It was called Simchat Bet Eva, which translates to mean the rejoicing at the place of the water drawing. This water libation is not explicitly mentioned in the Torah, but it is called Halacha Moshe Misinai, a law revealed to Moshe on Mount Sinai, to which the sages have found allusions in the Torah. It is written in the Tractate of Sukkah, He who has not seen the rejoicing at the place of the water drawing has never seen rejoicing in his life. So, Mayim, water, is actually connected to the Torah. We call Torah Mayim Chaim, living water, which can also mean that the Torah is our life. Now, water is also connected to humility. It, is, it always reaches down to the lowest point, which may be why it's an allusion to Torah, because God always loves anything that is humble. In addition, an interesting fact that you can live, this idea of water, you can live without food for seven days. Water, only three. And I believe it was Ezra that instituted that the Torah should be read with at least every three days, that there should never be more than three days without learning Torah. That just like a person will die without water, so too a person will die without Torah in a spiritual sense. Now, for the last 40 days, we have been totally involved in repentance and feelings of trepidation. Now we are expected to reach the highest levels of joy and ecstasy. How are we to understand this 180 degree turnaround in five days? Imagine, if a child had disobeyed his parent, the parent may well have had to discipline the child and issue certain threats should the disobedience continue. However, a loving parent would not want to leave the child with a feeling of dejection and negativity. He would want the child to know, in the end, that all is forgiven and that the parent and child relationship can once again be reunited. The recognition and admission of guilt on the part of the child may well bring about an even higher level of love and affection. So the negative situation that existed between child and parent may well be the engine that drives them to an even better and stronger relationship. As I mentioned before, this concept of a Yerida for an Aliyah, a descent for an even greater ascent. And this may be another reason as to why Sukkot is so joyous. Human nature. Human nature is such that many times we don't appreciate something until we lose it. God gave them the clouds of glory as a gift which they may well not have appreciated enough the first time. The clouds offered them protection from the sun and the heat during the day and gave them light and also warmth to combat the cold desert nights. In addition, the cloud under their feet allowed them to march without having to breathe in the desert sand. Think of it. There were at least three million people and all their animals Imagine how much sand that would kick up. It would be like walking through a sandstorm. You know, a personal experience, I had marching in the sand. It was no fun. I took my basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey, and they would march us in the sand with only 150 men. And afterwards, we were spitting up sand for hours. God has given us 613 mitzvahs, commandments to keep. 240 of them, 48 of them are commandments, 
are positive, and 365 are negative commandments. The 248 connect to the 248 limbs of our body, and the 365 connect to the 365 sinews of the body. Every commandment is connected to some limb in our body, and so when we sin, in some way we damage that limb that is connected to that commandment. The Chidah asked, how are we to understand the connection between the High Holidays and Sukkot? And he explains that these holidays are a gift from God to cure our sicknesses. The High Holidays were given to cure the sickness of the limb that is connected to a certain mitzvah. And the holiday of Sukkot was given for us to address the root of the sickness, much like taking therapy that will threaten, pardon me, strengthen and rehabilitate the whole body. So after we have done tshuva, repented, and have cured the pain, which is the high holidays, we now concentrate on what caused the pain initially, Sukkot. You know, they tell a story about a great rabbi who never went to a doctor. Yet, his students noticed that as unusual as it was, the Rebbe at one point did go to a doctor. But what was even more confusing to them was that after the doctor prescribed some medicine, the Rebbe did not fill the prescription. So they asked him, if he wasn't going to take the medicine, why did he bother going to the doctor in the first place? And he told them. He knew that he was sick, but he wasn't sure as to which part of his body was affected by the sickness. So he went to the doctor for the doctor to pinpoint the limb that needed treatment. He then was able to connect that knowledge to the sin that he needed to repent for. He saw his physical pain as a manifestation of a spiritual deficiency. I think what we're going to do is stop here. And... Um, Sukkot starts Friday night. Hope and pray that we'll be able to enter the Sukkot, especially this one with an extra measure of joy to combat the extra measure of darkness and fear that exists in the world today. And by combating this darkness and fear, may God bless us that we can usher in the coming of Shashiach Sukkot quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for coming. And again, have a great Sukkot. Remember to be happy. God bless you all. Thank you.